through the first three parts of that pattern for praying that we suggested this month. Remember, it's X, A, C, T, S. A stands for adoration, which is worship, worshiping God for who He is. Before we ever get to what He does, and there's a lot to thank Him for, but adoration is just worshiping Him for who He is. C is confession, coming clean, admitting things that separate between us and Him. As children of God, our salvation is secure. We are eternally saved, and yet there are things that we do and things that we say and sins we commit that keep us from enjoying the fellowship, right? We're like sent to our room with without our supper, um, but he's still our dad. So we confess to him because we want to move on through the prayer. We worship him for who he is. That hasn't changed. What has changed is is how I relate to him because of my sin. So I, I get that back on channels on, with the Lord. Nothing between my soul and the Savior. Nothing but grace and forgiveness and love. And then we go to Thanksgiving. We're able to say thank you, Lord, for this and that and the other. This is more what he does. We saw that in Psalm 145. The acts of the Lord, the works of the Lord, eight times in a few verses. And then we move today to supplication. Supplication. So we're finishing with a word that we don't hear about very often, but it's actually very common in Scripture. Did you know that the word supplication occurs more than 60 times in the Bible? And it means a request or a petition. It's asking for something from God. And we see it in places like the famous one that tells believers to put on the whole armor of God. And and then it says to pray always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. No ambiguity there. Supplication, supplication, supplication. Ask. Give your petition. Make your request. You've adored. You've confessed. You've thanked Him. And now it's time to say, These are the needs of my life. These are the needs of my family. These are the needs of my church and my community and my world. We're even commanded to do that in Philippians 4, 6, where it says, Be anxious for nothing. Look at the context here. It's about worry. Be anxious for nothing, but instead of worry, be in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. So there's a verse that we quote a lot. Maybe you don't realize that the word supplication is right smack dab in the middle of that. Prayer, including prayers of asking, is what he's saying. Supplication. Now, this should not be a tough message for me today, right? I mean, asking for stuff is kind of what we do. You might say, Pastor didn't work very hard. He has to say we're supposed to ask, and he can sit down. Because we're good at asking for stuff. We're experts on asking. We're good with gimmies. But I believe there are still things that we can learn about the ministry of asking that fits together with the ACTS and brings to a conclusion a series of messages, but to a beginning, I hope, of a change in your prayer life, a dynamic that you haven't had before. Let's pray, and then we'll look together at the text we've chosen. Thank you, Father, for the privilege of coming before you. We do love you today. With all our heart and all our soul and all our strength, we love you. All our mind, all that we have is yours, and we give it back to you freely, joyfully, hilariously, as the word means. There's no grudge stuff going on here. We're just, we're in love with you and we thank you. You've been so good to us. And we do come before you with requests. And you've told us to do that, but help us, Father God, and even the request to see it as a ministry and to see it as not about so much me, me, me as as you and, and others. And Father, there's so much rich truth to get here. May we squeeze some of it out and make, make it clear to our hearts, Holy Spirit. Change our lives as a result. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The first thing I want you to see about prayer of supplication is the attitude. The attitude. There's asking, and then there's asking. It can't be as simple as it sounds, or we'd pray more often, wouldn't we? If it's that easy, why aren't we doing it? Or we get more stuff, more done, more answers to prayer, more results. The fact of the matter is you can pray with the wrong motives. We've all done it before. And that's the idea behind James chapter 4. Would you start up in James chapter 4? We're going to move to our text for the morning in a few moments. But let's start in the book of James. And as you turn there, please stay there. There's a couple things that we will learn together as we look at the attitude of prayer. James chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. Very familiar passage. It says, You lost and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. 
You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss, that you may spend it on your pleasures. So he says, many times we don't ask, which, which is inconceivable, since we're good at asking. But sometimes we don't ask. I guess we think we can do it on our own. Just the really big requests go to God. But the little ones, I can take care of that. Me, myself, and my bank account, I don't know. Me and a few good friends. So we don't even ask when we should, sometimes. But then there's times that we ask, but it's for the wrong motives. It's with the wrong attitude. It's for the wrong request. You won't get answers if you don't ask, of course. But you also need to not just repeat a few words and expect that things are going to rain from heaven. We do need some attitude. And I see three. There's more, but three that we'll look at. We need to pray. Ask for things with an attitude of hope and expectation. Now, staying in James here, then look at James chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. When you pray, you should believe that God can answer and that He will answer and that maybe even He has answered already because the Old Testament says that before they call, I will answer. And while they are speaking, I will hear, which is an extraordinary statement in Scripture. But James 1, verse 5, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. Let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is double-minded. He is unstable in all his ways. So asking without faith is a waste of your time and God's. He says, ask believing. Ask with faith. Whatever is not of faith is sin. But if faith is involved, the Bible says that that's, you're on the right track. And so when we ask God for things, we shouldn't say, like, like I used to say when I was in my dating years, and I've told you before, I'm so thankful I'm 30 or 40 or whatever years beyond my dating years, but my dating, if I got the courage up at all, it would say, you wouldn't want to go out with me, would you? Which made it very easy for a multitude of ladies to say, no, actually. <laughs> That's not the way you come to God. I know you're not going to answer, but, well, just, you know, you're wasting time. I believe that God has called me to do this. I believe you want me to come. And Father, in Jesus' name, I've worshipped you, and I've confessed sin, and I've thanked you, and I'm presenting this request to you with the expectation that you are going to hear and you are going to answer. Pray with an attitude of hope. Pray with an attitude of, of happiness and joy. Now stay here a moment, but I do want to talk to you about 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Remember we talked about those three wonderful verses. 1 Thessalonians 5.16 says this, Rejoice always. Repeat after me, rejoice always. You just learned a verse. Good job, right? The next one says, Pray without ceasing. That's 1, Peter, 1 Thessalonians 5.17. Say that one. Pray without ceasing. You've learned two verses today. I want to eat your heart out. My adults are learning verses, okay? And the verse 18 is a little harder. In everything give thanks. Go ahead. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. A little more challenging, but we're all high school grads. We can do that, right? But I want you to see how they're sandwiched together. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. And everything give thanks. That's not a coincidence. When we pray, we pray with expectation. We pray with thanksgiving. We pray with joie, with joy, with happiness. Rejoice always. You can't separate a believing prayer from a happy prayer. Because we know the God who loves us. We've started out. You see, that's why it's so important that we do supplicating last. Because we spent time amazed by God. And our, just our, our, our amazement factor is like a, a scale of 100 times 100. And then you recognize your areas of failing, and you say, Lord, I give that back to you, and thank you for forgiving me, and thank you for this. And then you're already, I mean, you're primed. And you're able to say, I can't wait to bring this to you, Father. And so we share with happiness and with excitement. And so we see that rejoicing is at the heart of effective prayer. Not praying out of obligation, not simply because it's our duty. That's a have-to prayer, and God wants a wanna prayer, not a have-to prayer. Coming before God's throne of grace should be enjoyable, a pleasure. Remember the psalmist says this, I was what? I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And thanksgiving is part of that. That's why in the prayer we're going to look at in a bit in Colossians, he prays for something and he said, with thanksgiving. Because every true prayer 
Listen, every true prayer is with thanksgiving. Even if you're at the, at the end of your rope, even if you're down for the count, whatever the illustration you want to use, whatever the cliche, you've reached the end, even then you can say, thank you for hearing me. Thank you for loving me. Thank you that as bad as it is, it's not worse. Thank you. And so thankfulness is part of the, it's an attitude of gratitude. So we have hope, we have happiness, and then of course an attitude of humility. Now we're still back in James, right? If not, rush there with me please, because in James chapter 4, verse 6, we see one of the most important things to learn. How often does a pastor say that? This is one of the most important things you will learn. Listen, every day God deposits grace in your life. Grace alone doesn't just save us. There's saving grace, there's serving grace, there's suffering grace, there's dying grace. Grace is the enablement to do what God wants us to do. And I believe that every single day in your life as a believer, God has already deposited in your life all the grace you need for that day. He's already been through your day. He knows what your day is going to be like, and He has given you what you need. But you need to access that grace in your account. And this is why it's so important. James 4, verse 6. But He gives more grace. There we go. Serving, suffering, whatever it is. He gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Think about that. The very thing that you need is already available to you, and the only reason you're not getting it is because of either sin in your life or your own pride. What does pride look like? I can do this on my own. Then you don't need God's help. God resists pride every time. And so we say, well, why, why didn't God answer my prayer? The answer's already there. But you can't access it because of your pride and your selfishness and your, your motivation is wrong. And we need to have an attitude of humility. It says here, um, uh, therefore, verse 7, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Verse 10, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. That's, that's extraordinary. How do you fight the devil? By humbly coming to the Lord. It says that, right? God resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil. And he will take a hike. He will flee. Because you have come on bended knee. Bending knees is not just a, a practical... It's not just a, 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 an outward thing. It speaks of a bent knee in the heart. And so we have this attitude of humility. According to Hebrews chapter 4, when we approach the throne of grace, we are able to receive answers from the Lord as we come submitting to Him and to His will. And so God Himself will resist you if you have pride in your heart. That should be a good enough reason for you to be humble right there. Because He wants the God of the universe, our God, to resist us in our requests. We need grace for each new day and each new challenge in life. And God's enablement is there. Saving grace, as I mentioned, brought you into God's family. Serving grace makes you effective in ministry. Suffering grace takes you through hardship and through the valley of the shadow of death. Dying grace is needed. Have you ever said that before just about somebody that you knew, a Christian who was so calm and relaxed as they went through suffering like, like Job experienced? And you saw them go through this and they were so calm. And you said, how could they? I couldn't do that. Well, you're not dying yet. No, you can't do that. In fact, that's, that should be my mantra. I can't. What? But God can. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You don't need dying grace till you're dying. But when you are there, in the valley of the shadow of death, if you are humble before God and accepting His will and rejoicing and adoring Him even in the midst of the shadows, He will give you grace. And people will say about you, Wow, I can't believe they're so calm. You only get grace when you need it, and the grace is deposited, and the way we keep it away is by pride, and the way we open the floodgates is by humbling ourselves under God. So if we pray with humility, God hears, but listen, if we don't pray with humility, you will leave the throne room of grace empty-handed. And that's a tragedy. So let's go back to our pattern for effective prayer. When you start your prayer with adoration, you will want to come clean through confession. You'll respond with thanksgiving for the past gifts of grace, and you'll be ready to ask for the new one. And you'll come with happiness and with hope and with humility. That's the attitude. Now, with the attitude, let's look at the ask itself. What is the ask? 
And I would encourage you to turn to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, they're all stuck together right there. They're small books, but they're jam packed, crammed full of truth. God gave the Apostle Paul insights, more than that, revelation, revelation from God. The Bible was being written, and, and God didn't just give the Apostle Paul John Piper's commentary or John MacArthur's podcast. God gave Paul new truth revelation from God. And he gave that to us in the form of Scripture. Never, never doubt the authority of the Scripture. Because Paul didn't, Paul wasn't that smart. Paul went, remember it says in Galatians, he was, like for years, he was off alone and God was working on him and working in him and giving him and he said, I received this from the Lord. Not from the denomination. Not from the committee. Not from the installation board. I received this from God. This is what we have before us. It's God's Word. And I love the prayers. Colossians 1, 9 through 11. It is a great example of a supplication prayer. Understand that the, the act of asking has two parts. God's will and our wants. We know going into this that God's will is going to be done. Right? The arm of the Almighty... Listen. The arm of the Almighty is untwistable. You cannot twist God's arm to give you what you want because He's God and you're very much not. And we are commanded to pray, Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And if God's will is done, my will is undone. So the first thing we know is that God's will is the important. And by the way, every time, every time you pray, Thy will be done, that prayer will be answered. Every time. Right? So we ask for God's will to be done, but he also has told us to ask for things that we want. See, God gets the first and the middle and the final word, but he tells us as well, what would you like? Remember that with King uh, Solomon? In 1 Kings, God said to him, ask what you wish for me. God is speaking to the king. He says, ask what you want. Matthew 7, 7 states, ask and it will be given you, Right? John 14 says, Whatever you ask in my name, that I will do. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. And of course, this is John 15, 7. Read that with me, please. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. Now, that's a wonderful verse. These are wonderful promises. Now, are they contradictory? Not at all. When we spend time with God, in His Word, by His Spirit, His will overcomes and swallows up our wants. There's a divine alignment that goes on so that God's plan becomes our pleasure. His task becomes our ask. And now we're praying for the things that God wants anyway. And our will has been subjugated to, in a good way, that sounds like a bad word, right? Subjugated. We are swallowed up in the will of the God whom we love so that He can trust us with this thing like Ask what you will, because we say, what do you will, Father? And we're able to pray according to the Scripture, and those prayers are answered. So let's look at the, the prayer of supplication that I've chosen for our text this morning. And I want you to notice that Paul does not pray for physical things. I don't see finances mentioned. I don't see help mentioned. I don't see help mentioned. We're not talking about the rent. We're not talking about the neighbors. We're not talking about sickness. It's not wrong to ask for those things. We just did it a few moments ago. Jesus, uh, the Lord tells us in 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your care on him, for he cares for you. That's not just spiritual. It's not wrong to do that. But again, since we don't need any help praying for physical things, right? Got that one covered? I would like you to see that Paul, in his prayers, focuses on spiritual things. Too many times prayers never get beyond the physical to the deeper issues of the heart. I was always disturbed. Now, some of you that know that been here since I was here, when I came 15 years ago, I, was, I had a pet peeve. There was a certain thing that I was talking about. It was a book that was sweeping the nation. Millions of people were praying a certain prayer from the Old Testament, right? And so I made notice of that when I was candidating, and I mentioned I didn't like that prayer of Jabez. Oh, there it is. And I think you guys had just gotten through that, or somebody had, and I, I thought, well, I've ruined my chances there. But the prayer of Jabez is a disturbing thing to me. It's a little, it's in the scripture, 
But it was Jabez's prayer, and my name ain't Jabez, first of all. And millions of people pray this every day like a mantra. Here's what it went. Oh, that you would bless me indeed and enlarge my border, and that your hand might be with me, and that you would keep me from harm, that it might not hurt me. Please. Please. If that isn't the spirit of this age, I don't know what is. The prayers that Paul prays are real supplication. They're not give me, give me that, give me, give me this, I got a give me, give me mentality. It is focusing on the spiritual things. So I want you to look at that. Colossians 1, 9 to 11. Short prayer bathed in, in concern. He says before that, uh, that we've been thinking about you, we know about you, verse 12, giving thanks to the Father. But here's the prayer. For this reason we also, since the day we heard it, verse 9, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy. And he says, we give thanks as we pray. And I want you to see, first of all, the request. Take note of this. Paul's prayer list is very sparse. He is not praying for several things. Not that it's wrong, but in this prayer he is praying for one thing only, that God's people would be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. God doesn't want his children to get a little bit of his knowledge. He wants us to be completely filled with it. The word means to be controlled. It's used in the New Testament and other examples. Remember, Jesus is talking to the disciples. He's about to leave them. And the Bible says the disciples' hearts were filled with sorrow because he was going to leave them. Same word. Filled with the knowledge. They were controlled by sorrow. They were beside themselves, if you will, with sorrow. The word is used about the Pharisees. The Pharisees' hearts, the Bible says, were filled with rage when Jesus healed on the Sabbath. Same word. Filled with rage. Filled with sorrow filled with the knowledge of God's will. The believers in this New Testament says they are filled with the Holy Spirit. Same word. Stephen was called a man full of faith. Same word. What are we saying? In each of these examples, the people who has, when it says they're full of something, it means they are controlled by it. Controlled by wrath. Controlled by sorrow. Controlled by the Holy Spirit. Controlled by faith and controlled by the knowledge of God's will. This is a comprehensive knowledge, not a cursory one. It signifies a deep, thorough understanding of God's revealed plan for our lives. And how is this prayer answered? By spending time with Christ in His Word. Look at chapter 2 for a moment. Colossians. Chapter 2, 2 and 3. Do you know that all wisdom of the ages is hidden in Christ? That's a, it, it's an amazing thing. Colossians 2, 2. That their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, and attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, in Christ, in whom are hidden, verse 3, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. We have Christ. We belong to Him. And hidden in Him are all truth, all knowledge, everything you'll ever need. So the way to, he, to be filled with the knowledge of God's will is to spend time in Jesus' presence, and is to spend time in the Word of God, and is to spend time in prayer. Now, do we need knowledge? Oh, boy, do we need knowledge. Psalm 19, 2. It is not good for a soul to be without knowledge. There's a lot of people around us that have no knowledge. Remember Jesus said in the Old Testament in Hosea, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. We need a word from the Lord. But not a fresh one. I don't need someone to come and come up and make up something. We have the word of God right here. God's will is no secret. If you want to know what God wants you to do, take a look at the things that are always His will. Right in your notes, I have a list of them. It is always God's will for a person to be saved. It is always God's will that a believer be filled with the Holy Spirit. It is always God's will that we be sanctified. It is always God's will that we give prayer and thanksgiving, the verses that you quoted and learned together earlier. It is always God's will that we submit to the government and the authority above us. When you say, I don't know God's will, I'm saying you haven't been reading much. By that we mean, should I go to this school or that school? Should I buy this car or that car? Should I get blue carpet, red carpet, green carpet, no carpet? Yes, that's kind of trivial, isn't it? God's will is your sanctification. 
and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. If you're not thankful, you're out of his will. You could be preaching and be out of his will. You could be singing in the choir or the praise team and be out of his will if you're not holy. So we know some things, right? He makes it clear for us. So after the request in chapter chapter 1, verse 9, we see five results of that request. See, the mind is critical to everything else. As a man thinks in his heart, the Bible says, so is he. It's, it's from within that makes a difference. And that's why we see that what controls our thoughts controls our behavior. So in verse 10, Colossians 1, it says, after 9, I pray that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding so that so that you may walk worthy. Now listen, I have I, I go through several commentaries. I have certain ones that I like first. I, I look at I see what is God saying to me from the scripture. I pray about it. I'm working on messages for weeks ahead of time, months ahead of time. So God's, God's always working on me first, which is kind of cool when you're a teacher or a pastor. But then I look at other commentaries, and I kept looking at more. I went online this time, which I don't like to do. And they all talked about the five requests in Colossians 1. And they're all wrong. There aren't five requests. Look at the grammar. So that, then there's gerunds and there's ings in there, you know. These are things that happen. He doesn't say pray. He said, I am praying for this one thing. One person even said that verse 12 is a prayer request. He says, I'm giving thanks to the Father. That's the fifth prayer request. No, it's not. Go back to Bible school. It's very clear that there's one request. One request, and the rest of these things are, are results. Listen, when you are filled with the knowledge of God's will in all spiritual understanding, these results will be yours. First of all, we will walk worthy. We will walk worthy of our calling. Walk, in verse 10, speaks of a daily conduct, right? If you're not feeling worthy, that's okay, because you're not. But God makes you worthy, right? It, it's not like God saw some spark of goodness. There's no spark of goodness in man. This fatherhood of God, brotherhood of man, we're all going to heaven, universalism stuff. Give me a break. I've lived too long. And I see that that's not true. We are made worthy by the one who has given us everlasting life. I'm crucified with Christ. And I no longer live. But Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who gave himself for me, right? And so this exchanged life, I brought all of my junk and he gave me heaven. I brought all that I am, which is garbage, and he gave me all these. I brought him gutter. He takes me to the uttermost, right? And so it's an exchanged life, and it, it's a great result. So we are able to walk worthy because of what he has done in us, because of salvation. And then by his spirit who lives inside of us, built his home in us, will never move away without leaving a forwarding address. The Holy Spirit enables us to walk in a holy way. There's different times in scripture, we won't look at all of them, but a holy walk, a worthy walk rather, is a humble walk, a pure walk, uh, a content walk, a faith walk, uh, a walk in good works, uh, in love, in light, in truth. So when you know what God wants you to do, you are able to walk worthy. You don't need a second prayer request. You've got it because you've got the, the knowledge of it will. And what controls your mind controls your life. Secondly, the result will be that we will be fruitful. We will live a fruitful life. Verse 10, continuing, so that you may walk worthy of the Lord. Paul is telling us his heart. Here's why I'm praying for you. Here's what I'm praying in verse 9. Here's why I want you to walk worthy of the Lord. I want you to be fully pleasing to him, being fruitful in every good work and continue to, to increase in the knowledge of of God. Fruit is the byproduct of righteousness that brings the Father glory. What's some of the fruit that we talk about? Well, the Bible talks about giving to the Lord's work as, as fruit. Godly living is fruit. New converts are fruit. When we're filled with the knowledge of God and His will, we're filled with the Spirit. And what does the Spirit bring to us? Can you read this with me as well? But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, Goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That's walking fruitful. That's the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. So when we're filled with the knowledge of God's will and all understanding and wisdom, we will grow in faith. Verse 10 continues here. Increasing in the knowledge of God. So the idea is the Bible says that we should grow in grace. 
and the knowledge of Him. I've been a Christian for almost 55 years, in another couple weeks. I've been a pastor for, a senior pastor, for, I guess pastor, pastor, 38 years. And I still not got everything figured out. Some of you have been walking with the Lord as many years as I've been around, which is <coughs> 60 if you hadn't figured that out. How many of you have got all figured out? Careful. The elders are watching. None of us, right? We're still growing in grace and the knowledge of Him. We're still amazed. If you don't wake up amazed by God, there's something wrong. You read the scripture and you say, wow, when did God put that in there? Well, thousands of years ago. You've probably read it tens and hundreds of times. But there's a new day and there's new manna. And you say, thank you, Lord, I never saw that before. Amen? Turn to First Peter. First Peter, all these books are close together. We're being easy on you today. First Peter, chapter 2 and verse 2. We'll start in verse 1, because that's always a good idea, I reckon. First Peter 2, 1 and 2. Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking, which you can only do if the Holy Spirit, if you're walking in the Spirit, look at 2, as newborn babes, desire the pure milk of the Word, that you may grow thereby, since you have tasted that the Lord is good. Isn't that cool? We can grow as newborn babes. Now, it doesn't mean you're always a baby, but your, your growth should always be like newborn babes. How do newborn babies eat? Voraciously. They, they, they eat one thing, but they, they, they really enjoy it. You know what I'm talking about? We've had five babies, and I know you can hear the sound across the room. Am I right? So there's a voracious desire. So he said, even if you're a senior saint, you should grow like a newborn baby. You can't wait. What's the verse... What's going to be in the Bible today? What's going to be in the sermon today? And then 2 Peter 3.18. Some of you know this verse very well. One of my favorites. 2 Peter 3.18. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory of both now and forever. Amen. And we say it a lot around here, but salvation is not the beginning of the end. It's just the end of the beginning. You're going to grow in grace. You're going to grow in knowledge. It's your, your blesser gets more blessed every day. And someday we're going to go to heaven and just have eternity with all the things that God has for us. We will grow in faith. When your mind is full, when your heart is full of the knowledge of God, we will be strong. Verse 11, back in, in Colossians 1. Strengthened with all might according to His glorious power. So again, why isn't that a prayer request, Pastor? Because it's, it's related to verse 9. Again, grammatically, you can't, you can't look at it. It's there. The, the rules of grammar apply in Scripture. God used words, sentences, syntax. But also, when you think about it, do we need to pray for power? Don't we already have power? Isn't that in the, in the continuous present tense, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What prayer request do you see there? Lord, give me power. Got it. Give me yourself. Give me more of yourself. Oh, how I hate that one. More of you. Give me more of you. Excuse me? How much did I get the first time? Half? Holy but no spirit? He's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Past tense. We have the power. But we don't know where to apply the power. We don't understand the power. We don't see the power. We're walking in our own power until our mind is filled with the knowledge of the will of God. And we say, oh. And you live for the Lord and things happen. And so you are a powerhouse for Jesus if you're in the Word and if you're in the Spirit. So it's a result, not a request. Not here. Not in this text. It's a result. We will be strong. Spiritual power will characterize the life of obedience to God's will. Strengthened is a present participle that signifies continuous action. It's not a booster rocket that gets us into Christian orbit and then falls back to the earth useless. It is an ongoing power. It's, a, it's the word dunamis, which you've heard pastors talk about that, dynamite. That's the Greek word, dunamis. It is a power that helps you live your entire life. What good is a salvation that gets you in but doesn't get you home? What good is a salvation that gets you in but you have a lousy life on the way home? I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And you're in because of Christ. You've trusted in Him. But if you're not following Him, if you're not understanding His will, you will be a miserable Christian. A 
mean, that's a contradiction of terms. The lions have fallen to me in lovely places, says the psalmist. I have a good heritage. I have set the Lord before me. And because he's at my right hand, I shall not be moved. That's joy unspeakable and full of glory. So pray for one another that you'd have a, a knowledge of God's will because these things result. And finally, we will finish the Christian life well. We will finish well. For all impatience, for all patience rather, and long suffering with joy, the endurance that you need. The problem with the Christian life is not that it's so difficult, but that it's so long. You and I can be full of the Spirit and excited and doing stuff for Jesus, but it's hard to maintain that and to sustain that if you do it in your own power. But if you're walking with the Lord, the Bible says, walk with me, walk in the Spirit. That's, that's a life of dependence, one step at a time. He doesn't say jump in the Spirit. He doesn't say run a marathon in the Spirit. Yes, it's marathon running, but you take that marathon one step at a time. There's no shortcut. And so he says, I want you to walk with me step by step, moment by moment, and I will take you through, and you will be glad for the journey. My favorite definition of discipleship is long obedience. You've heard me say it before. Long obedience in the same direction. God wants long obedience. Endurance. Faithfulness. How do you get that? By being filled with the knowledge of His will. Understanding what God wants helps me to know what to do. Oh, that's what you want me to do, God? I think I'll just do it. The best way to get along with God is to find out what He wants and do it. He tells us what He wants us to do. He gives us the Spirit to enable us to do it. So the prayer would be not that, that I would have power, not that I would be able to finish well or those things. The, the, the main request is, may I be so controlled by the knowledge of your will. May your word be like honey from the rock so that I know what I'm supposed to do and I'm able to do it. What a joy it is to make supplication for one another. To pray prayers like this, intelligent, thoughtful, consequential prayers that God loves to hear and answer in His way, on His schedule, and for His glory. Oh, keep on praying for the needs of your life. Please do it because God wants to, do, to, to answer those prayers, right? He loves you. He's your Father. But don't stop with that. Don't stop with that. There's other things. In fact, maybe we shouldn't start with that, amen? There's other things that God wants for us. And I hope that you are praying differently as a result of this four-part series that we have studied together in a new month of a new year. Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. Let's pray. God, heaven, I thank you so much for the privilege of coming before you. You are an awesome God, and we are a needy people. But our needs are greater than just a moment. Lord, we're always going to need more food, and the car, everything new is going to break down. The warranty is going to end, and so is the effectiveness of the product. Things are made to break down. But the Bible says that the path of the just is as a shining light that shines greater and brighter to the coming day. The Bible says that you have started to work in us and you will complete it in the day of Christ Jesus. The Bible says that though the outward is perishing, the inward man is renewed day by day. And that's what we want. That's the life of, of joy and satisfaction and abundance. And help us in our prayers to start off right every day, every crisis, every moment. And you'll receive honor and glory as we do that in Jesus' name. Amen.